Good God. We've been speaking on the reigning ones out of Isaiah 11. If you would turn in your Bibles, please. We will continue. Praise the Lord. All right, so how are you doing? <laughs> We're doing great. It's been a <clears throat> rather heavy afternoon. <laughs> or maybe we should say no not light definitely heavy <laughs> heavy in the glory we didn't even know if we'd make it here once we got here we didn't know if we'd make it in praise the Lord well you're at Isaiah 11 correct <laughs> don't get me started <laughs> and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord and shall make him of a quick understanding and his delight shall be in the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, neither decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness and justice shall he judge the poor and decide with fairness for the meek, for the poor and the downtrodden of the earth. And he shall smite the earth and the oppressor with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. I'm sorry. It just keeps coming in in waves. <laughs> and when it comes in, it's like everything stops. I can't really think straight. <laughs> she's coming alive. She's <laughs> and when righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist, and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Maybe someone should cover her. <laughs> someone should get a blanket. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, now this is a serious subject. <laughs> okay, now... <laughs> <laughs> She's the quiet type. <laughs> okay, now where did we leave off? And righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist, and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. Well, for those of you who have not been with us since we began this series, I want to share with you what this is all about. We're talking about the reigning ones, those who are, who, whose mind is to leave the world behind and go deep in God, and therefore to be used mightily by God. Years ago, I had spent considerable time every day opening my Bible and praying to the Lord. I would read this passage and I would ask him, Lord, I know that this passage is about my Messiah. I know that. I understand that. It was about the coming Christ, 
I understand that. But there's something deep inside of me that is aching, yearning, longing for this to be upon me. And so I ask you, Lord, to give it to me. I want it more than I want to breathe. I would pray in that manner every day. And I meant it sincerely. It felt like I just couldn't survive if he didn't say yes, that I could have this. So after I had prayed in this way for two years, I was praying one day out of this passage when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me. And he said, Nita, come and stand next to me. As I did, a double yoke bar, as you would put on two heads of oxen, suddenly appeared on his shoulders and expanded until it, they were resting also on my shoulders and we became double yoked. As this yoke bar appeared and set on my shoulders, everything that was in me, all of my human passions, good and bad, went down, 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 and out my feet. Now, it went, it, it left me in this manner because God was speaking of the self-emptying that would have to occur before I could be filled with his presence in this manner. Down, 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 and out my feet. Human love, human happiness, human anger, all passions, good and bad, down, 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 and out my feet, like water pouring out of the bottom of a, of, a, of, a jar, of a jar. When I was empty, everything that was going on inside of my Lord began to fill me and go on inside of me. What was going on inside of him? The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord. The amazing thing is, is when the seven spirits of God own you, it does something inside of you. It creates in you a humility, a meekness, because there is a total absence of pride. As I've shared many times since I began teaching on this, you don't realize how much pride you have in your heart until it's all removed. And Jesus walked with no pride, no lust, no carnality of any manner. He was totally pure, all God, all man. When the seven spirits of God filled me when the nature and the character of my Lord filled me, all of these things were swallowed up in him. It was no longer my nature, no longer my character, but his nature, his character, that filled me. Once I was filled, he looked at me and he said, Nita, you have been praying for two years that I would give you Isaiah 11, 2 through 5. And he quoted the passage to me. And he said, I've come to allow you to experience what it means to be filled with the seven spirits of God. What you are now experiencing is Isaiah 11, 2 through 5. This is what it means to be consumed, to be possessed, by the seven spirits of God. He further told me that when he walked this earth, he would walk and he would say to the people, all you who are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. He quoted the whole passage, Matthew eleven twenty eight, the whole passage to me. And he said, I would say, to these, say this to the people, and he said, it wasn't, it was true. I was concerned about how Judaism had become a yoke of bondage rather than a means of worship and a means of relationship. But that is not what I was asking them to exchange with me. 
I was asking them to take my yoke and to give me their yoke, the yoke of the sinful nature. And what happens when the, the yoke of the sinful nature is removed from the soul, the soul is at last free to make its ascent into God, and thus the filling of the seven spirits of God. This is life above the curse. That's why they're called the reigning ones. Those who are filled in this manner are called reigning ones because they really walk in two spheres at the same time. They rule and they reign from the heavenly sphere while their feet walk on the ground, just like Jesus did. He, he came, you know, to bring many sons into glory. And when the Bible refers to the bringing of many sons into glory, it isn't just meaning Christians, people getting saved and becoming Christians and then living for the world while they live for Jesus. It, it isn't referring to that at all. It is referring to sons who have made um, a break from the things of the world and have gone deep in God and have become mature sons. Those who look like Jesus in nature and in character. Now, some might say, how can that be this side of heaven? Very easy. God made a plan many thousands of years ago, before ever he created Adam, he made a plan. He knew Adam was going to fall. He knew that when he pulled his people Israel out of the world, that they too would fail. He knew that when he brought the church into being, that it wouldn't be what he created it to be either. He knew that there would be many failures along the way. But he also knew that the day would come when a company of people would love him so much that they would leave the world behind to go deep in God. And that these people would live in the end days. And his joy was to give these people his kingdom, to give these people his very self, so that they could do the work of building up his church. The reigning ones are not walking in glory simply because they want to. They're walking in glory because God is going to use them to bring the church to its highest caliber of glory this side of heaven. These are going to be remarkable men, men and women. People who, because they are filled with the seven spirits of God, will walk in the mind of the Lord. As I have shared in past nights, when you are filled with the seven spirits of God, you no longer think your thoughts. Jesus has literally come to, to take up his dwelling place in your soul. Not just your spirit, but your entire soul is now possessed with Christ. He lives there. He rules there. He animates your being from this position of reigning. He brings you to the position of reigning in heaven. And he owns your mind. You no longer think your own thoughts. You think his thoughts. He's thinking through you. Your heart belongs to him. His passions are his passions through you. You're, never, you're not any longer living in your own passions. You're walking in the spirit of wisdom. So... Your quest is God and the kingdom. No longer the things of the world, as I've shared in past nights. Human wisdom will lead you into the world every time. Divine wisdom will take you deeper into God and into the kingdom, into the things of God every time. God's wisdom will always lead you into the bosom of God, and it will always lead you there via the cross. So these reigning ones will have been people who have embraced the cross, the life of the cross, until the world has been crucified to them, and they to the world. And they are living in Christ, wholly and completely. They'll have the spirit of understanding so that they understand the wisdom of God. 
not only will they walk in the wisdom of God, but they'll understand the wisdom of God. And they will know how to implement the wisdom of God. In these last days, because darkness is going to be so dark, the church is going to be so lost without God intervening by his spirit in a remarkable way. Because of this, God is pulling himself out people and has been now for a few decades. People who will leave the world behind to go deep in him, to walk in his wisdom, to walk in his power, to walk in his authority, to walk in everything that they need to help equip the church to, to rule and reign during the days of darkness. So Spirit of Wisdom gives them the insight as to what it takes to, to live in God and to bring God to the earth in this remarkable way. The spirit of, of understanding gives them an understanding heart as to how to implement the wisdom of God. The spirit of counsel is not only God's counsel directly to them, but uh, establishes God's counsel in the earth regarding the church and regarding the world. Uh, one who walked in the spirit of counsel was Joseph. Remember Joseph of Old Testament renown. He was a man who God lifted up in a remarkable way in Egypt through the spirit of counsel. So the spirit of counsel is not just for the individual, but God uses it to help nations, uses it to help churches, uses it to help people. But even so, as with Joseph, he uses it to help nations. Then the spirit of knowledge, we're going to talk about that. And tonight we're going to talk about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now turn it, please, in your Bibles to Proverbs 8.13. It says, A reverent fear and worshipful awe of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, pride, arrogance, the evil way, and perverted and twisted speech I hate. A Christian cannot grow in God without the fear of the Lord. It is the first thing that must occur for growth to begin. You can be saved many, many years. You can be saved 20, 30 years in the Lord and not have the fear of God. When people don't have the fear of God, sin is easy, even though they're saved. They don't necessarily feel convicted when they sin. Now, depending upon the degree of the fear of God that you walk in, uh, you may find it easier to sin, say, smaller sins, but you can't sin in deeper, greater ways. But one who is really um, owned by the fear of God cannot sin. The pain of sinning against God is so deep and so real. Um, th there's just no desire. The, the gift enables them to withstand the temptation, no matter how deep the temptation may be, because they fear God. They have come to the place, just like it says here in, in uh, Proverbs, that the fear of the Lord includes the hatred of evil, the hatred of pride, the hatred of arrogance, the hatred of the evil way, the hatred of the perverted and twisted speech. Someone who walks in the fear of God hates what God hates and loves what God loves. It's deeply painful to them to even consider sin of any kind. And for the church in the last I would say probably 30, 40, maybe even 50 years, the, the grace message has almost been perverted to the point that the church feels that it can sin and grace is there to cover. And there is no call to deeper levels of holiness. The church has not been taught that it really can walk in purity such as Jesus himself walked in. The church has not been taught this. However, it is true. 
Not only can we, but we've been called to walk. Jesus said, be perfect even as... That's right. He is calling us to perfection, not unlike he himself walked in. This perfection comes as a person is ever increased in the fear of the Lord. Let me share an experience with you. Uh, many years ago, I was in, in, I was actually in Israel, and I was in worship. I felt myself going higher and higher, deeper and deeper into the realm of worship, and I knew in a moment I was going to be free of this world and I would be in heaven. I just knew it. So I pushed through and I pushed through when suddenly I was released and I found myself in the throne room with the Father. Now, it wasn't a manifestation of the Father such as, as I had experienced before where he, he manifests himself as, you might say, a reigning king. But rather, it was the glory of the Father. And I can't even describe it to you. I won't describe it to you because it was so holy. Um, as the glory of the Father rose and emanated into the room, the Father himself was encircled with his glory. This glory was so brilliant, the majesty so incredible, the holiness so penetrating that I found myself in anguish. Here I am, an intercessor. I love the Lord. I've been in the ministry, you know, going on 30 years. I live a pure and holy life, but I was in anguish. And I was in anguish because of the holiness of God. He was so holy that even my refined spirit, my refined soul, could not bear to be in the light of his holiness. Paul refers to God in this way. He speaks of him as dwelling in the light that no man can gaze into. And I can promise you, this part of God is of such a nature that no man can gaze into it. You cannot see into the, you might say, the bosom of this, this side of God, this reality of God. Your soul can't take it. You can't bear it. He's too holy. My Every part of my being was shaking with such trembling, such fear of God because of his holiness. When you have been in that presence, you cannot come back and sin easily. You cannot disobey easily. When you have been before the presence of God and you have learned the fear of God, you cannot speak his name easily because of the awe of him. When um, you have been in this presence, you cannot, it makes, it makes the world a totally different place. You see the world through different eyes. You see the world, you know, of course, there's much beauty in the world. We have nature that presents us with every kind of beauty imaginable. And people are beautiful. God loves people. He's created them after his image, and people are beautiful. But there is this seemly side of the world, this side that, that exalts what is sin, what is sinful, exalts and breeds idolatry of, of that which is impure and very offensive in the eyes of God. And to be in a world where this stuff is rampant. You know, it's almost like, it's almost like, it's almost like, well, I've ministered in India. And one of the saddest things that I saw in India 
was there is an idol or a shrine, it seems like on every street corner, everywhere you look, there is idolatry. The idol may be small, am I right? The idol may be small, it may be 50 feet tall, but the idols are everywhere, and they're of every conceivable sort. I mean, there's like 300 million gods in India, so the idols take on many shapes and sizes. And where there isn't an idol, there is a shrine to the idols. And so for me to go to India is very painful because it's like walking into Satan's kingdom. You say, well, Nita, <laughs> you are in Satan's kingdom. This is the world. But it's different. It's just different. The idolatry, the idols are always so perverted looking. The idolatry is so sad, is so heartbreaking, and it's just the perversion of, of everything that is pure and holy. Well, when you've been in that presence and you return to, to, to earth, suddenly everyone, everything seems to take on this, this sense of what perverts the beauty of holiness, what perverts the beauty of the majesty of God. And what is born in your soul is the fear of God. So that offending him is very, very, very difficult. You don't do anything lightly when it comes to, say, following his direction. If he speaks, you stay, you endure, even if it's painful to endure. Because you fear God. You can't bear to be out of his will because you don't want to be out of his presence. You want to be able to see into God, see the heart of God, live in the life of God. Do you, do, am I helping you understand? Everything changes when God has created in you his fear of God, which is much different than man's fear of God. Everything I'm sharing with you about the seven spirits of God is, is like a quantum leap beyond what a Christian knows in this life normally. Let's look at Proverbs 16.6. It says, By mercy and love, truth and fidelity, to God and man, not by sacrificial offerings. Iniquity is purged out of the heart, and by the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord, men depart from and avoid evil. The fear of God teaches you to hate evil. It teaches you to avoid evil. You don't hate evil and avoid evil to gain the fear of God. The fear of God teaches you to hate these things, and further, to avoid these things. And he brings about in you the desire and the willingness to live in the life of Christ, subjecting yourself to all demands and commands of the Spirit, and to resist all demands of the flesh. It takes you in, into, into an entirely different life. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 2. Let's look at that. It says, now this is the instruction, the laws and the precepts which the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land to which you go to possess it. That you may reverently fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, and keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that the days of of your, the, the days, your days may be prolonged. So living in the fear of God prolongs your life. It prolongs your life in holiness and in the pleasure of God. Let me, let me explain something to you that most Christians are not aware of. Your time in this world, your time in this life, is given for the purpose of preparing you for eternity. Period. 
that's why you're here is to prepare you for eternity your actions your attitudes your willingness to go deep in God will determine how you will walk in eternity you start out here and if you never become more than a mundane Christian you know a, a pew potato someone who will listen to the gospel over and over again but never allow it to change their lives who they are the way they are the way they think what they are in God someone like this will live their whole life locked between two worlds when they get to heaven they will be on the lowest rung of heaven and they will be there all of the days of their life as heaven continues to graduate in the light and in the knowledge of God they will always be even in the graduating process on the lowest rung in the on the ladder of course they'll be glad to be in heaven rather than hell but they will never walk as close to the glory as someone who has prepared themselves now I've been taken up into the spirit and been given the privilege of meeting some of the Saints that's not sin God has no problem with bringing Saints from earth into uh, you know into heaven to meet our brothers and sisters that have already gone on he has no problem with that he does have a problem with us talking to the dead so but as Jesus said you know Abraham um, Isaac and Jacob were not God was not the God of the dead he was the God of the living and so he doesn't have a problem doing this and I have had the privilege of being able to meet some of the Saints and I find that those who walked particularly close to God in this life um, shine with such a brilliance in heaven not only a brilliance but such a majesty and such a holiness that it is very very difficult to look upon them those Saints that didn't go quite as far in God still shine they still emanate the glory of God they're still awesome people to be around but they don't bear the same kind of terror of the Lord in their presence as those who have gone deep for instance one of the Saints that I've been given the privilege to meet is Moses and because he walked so deep in God in this life he I can't be with him I can't be near him uh, very long because of the terror of the Lord that emanates from that man because he he lives so holy here and in heaven he lives in the top echelons of heaven because his soul was so refined here now when you have the fear of God because the fear of God provokes you to pull deeper and deeper away from the world deeper and deeper into God your your soul is more purified it becomes more and more holy until you are you are happier you are more at rest more at peace your passions are at they find their home in the presence of God and it's unbearable to you not to walk in that tangible presence because the fear of the Lord has taught you to hate evil it's taught you to hate all things that God hates and to love all things that God loves let's look at Exodus 20 18 through 21 it says now all the peoples perceive the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the smoking mountain and they they looked as they looked they trembled with fear and fell back and stood afar off and they said to Moses you speak to us and we will listen but let not God speak to us lest we die and Moses said to the people fear not for God has come to prove you so that the reverential fear of him may be before you that you may not sin and the people stood afar off but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was can you imagine such a scene can you imagine being Moses 
Can you imagine being the, the children of Israel at the bottom of that mountain with all of its burnings, with all of the thunder, with a trembling, shaking mountain? And you see Moses, your leader, going up to the top of the mountain, entering in through the fire, and you hear the thundering voice of God. May I tell you something else that happened in the giving of the Ten Commandments? This is not known in the Gentile church, but it is uh, a Jewish history. When the Ten Commandments were given, a remarkable thing occurred. You see, when God the Father speaks, his words are so filled with power, so filled with life, they must produce something. God cannot speak without it producing life. It's not possible. If God speaks a human being into existence, he simply says, you know, Gale be. If he speaks a, a world into existence, earth be. If he speaks the sun into existence, sun be. His words must produce life because he's God. So here he is on the top of the mountain. He is giving the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. Every word that is coming out of the mouth of God is going forth down to the bottom of the mountain, encircling every Jewish soul at the bottom of that mountain, wrapping them in his glory, taking their souls up into a place of revelation that is so pure and so powerful that for a moment, each Jewish person was lifted out of the temporal and into the spirit, and they saw the truth about God. They saw the truth about the world. They saw the truth about the temporal plane, and they saw the truth about the kingdom of God. It's not in our Bible, but it is part of Jewish history. This has been handed down from generation to generation since the days of the giving of the law. Israel was elevated to understand the kingdom of Messiah. When they came down from that experience and came back into the temporal, you know, it would be equated to a Christian coming up into a prayer line, receiving prayer, and the power of God overtaking them and taking their spirits to heaven. The same kind of thing. And they come back and they share about the glories that they saw when they were in heaven. It's the same kind of thing. That's what happened to Israel. That's what made their transgression so bad. Because they did for a moment understand truth as God intended it to be. They understood that the giving of the law was not something that was an end to itself. But rather... It was an instrument that was designed to help them understand their need for a connection to the kingdom. It was a remarkable experience. So here we see that the people are, have, been, have been given the revelation of God to teach them to fear God. Can you feel it in your heart? Can you feel the call? God wants to give every Christian the fear of God. He wants to impart to you the fear of God that will allow him to give you the revelation of the kingdom, to give you the revelation of Jesus Christ. The church in the past, in the past 2,000 years, has had such a minuscule understanding and revelation of Jesus Christ that if we knew the whole of it, it would boggle our minds that we have settled for so little. But the day is coming and it's close at hand through these, these reigning ones who have paid the price to learn the revelation of God. Think about, oh, just think about this for a moment. Think about John, the one who received the book of Revelation. Here he had walked with the Lord for three and a half years. After the Lord was taken, John continued his quest into God until he walked with, in union with Christ. He lived in the deep places of God. 
One day, he is in worship. He is wrapped in the spirit. Oh, I can just see it. I can feel it in my heart. He is wrapped in the spirit. And the revelation begins. Jesus appears to him. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And he begins to give him the revelation of himself. No one had told him about these things before. Of course, Jesus shared many things with him when he was here on this earth. But the revelations that were given to John, right in the book of Revelation, we are told you are being given new prophecies for the nations. He was given brand new revelation. And he was told that his revelation regarding the nations was, in fact, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was given to see what no man before him had seen. Not even the Apostle Paul, in all of his profound revelation, had been given to see what John, the beloved, saw that day before the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about what it would be like for you to be sitting, worshiping the Lord. Suddenly, the Lord Jesus Christ himself appears to you and takes you up into the heavenlies and teaches you the revelation of himself. How would it change your heart? How would it change your life? This is what is coming to the church. We think we have the revelation of Jesus Christ. We do not. There is so much of this Bible that has not been unveiled to the church that it would, make your, it, would make, it would break your heart to know how little you have compared to how little God wants to give you. The church, to enter into the growth that God requires for these last days, must have this revelation because it is revelation that brings growth to the church. And God will bring this revelation through the reigning ones. Those who have been filled and who live their lives by the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Let's look at Proverbs 15. 1533. It says, The reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord brings instruction and wisdom and humility and comes before honor. To have the fear of the Lord is to know instruction in humility. To have the fear of the Lord is to walk the path where God is ever increasing his honor upon you and your honor among men. I think it's raining. <laughs> Let's look at First Chronicles 16. Sixteen twenty-nine and 30. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and in holy array. Tremble and reverently fear before him all the earth. Peoples, the world also shall be established so it cannot be moved. Turn with me also to Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 2. It says, for all these things my hand has made. And so all these things have come into being by and for me, says the Lord. But this is the man to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken and wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commandment. If you want more attention from God, live your life in a place where you tremble at God's word. God is bringing those who will draw near to him into a place where they tremble before him.
because this is the genuine fear of the Lord. You can fear the Lord in that you know he's God, you know he's holy, and you don't want to do a lot to upset him. But to live every moment of your life in fear and trembling of displeasing him, as the Bible teaches, is an entirely different life. And, I might add, it is a much more fruitful life, a much more productive life. It's a life where your heart knows happiness and joy as it can never know any other way. Knowing the pleasure of the Lord is indeed life abundant. The church doesn't walk there. But God is calling those who will to come and learn what it means to tremble at his word. To learn what it means to walk in a bro broken and wounded spirit. This does not mean that you are someone who's been hurt by somebody. And so, you know, your heart is broken or your, your spirit is wounded because someone has been unkind to you. That's not what this is referring to. It is, a, it is a state of spirit and soul that is created by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to one who is given over to the love of God. There is a love that is so high and so holy, so pure and so lovely. It is the most desired of all of the virtues of Christ and cannot be attained without a broken and a contrite heart. Only the heart that has been broken by the Spirit of God, only one who walks in the contrition of brokenness can know the love divine, can understand the purity that flows through the genuine and true love of God. And the only one that can walk in that place is one who knows the fear of God, has learned to tremble in God's presence. When you see people up in front and they are trembling and shaking and quaking and travailing and wailing over their sins, the Holy Spirit is breaking them. He's wounding them. He is imparting in them the spirit of contrition where they are beginning to see sin from God's perspective instead of their own perspective. And to that one, God may reveal himself. What is life this side of heaven? I have more to share, but I'm not going to share it tonight. I want to talk to you from my heart. What is life if it is not to know God? What is life if it is not to know God? To know him deeply, to know him intimately, to know, to think his thoughts, to know that he has imparted to you something that is so holy to him his thoughts, his passions. He's a holy God. When he touches you, when he touches you, he reaches out and he touches you. That's holy. And he wants you to be holy. When he gives you the privilege of seeing in the spirit what he sees, that's holy. And he wants you to be holy. When he releases to you the insight, the understanding, the sense of his nearness, of his word, of his truth, of his life, that is holy. And he wants you to be holy. Why? Because he wants you to know him. He wants to become more to you than just a black and white Bible. He wants you to know him. He wants you to feel what he feels. He wants you to understand things about his kingdom and things about the world, the way he feels about them, the way he understands them, the way he sees them. 
He wants you to see the church through his eyes. He wants you to see your husband, your wife, your children through his eyes. He wants you to see creation through his eyes. He wants you to understand why. Why would God make the world? Why would he make the solars, the solar systems? Why would he make the stars? Why? Why would he make man? Why would he make you? Because he is love. He wants you to be touched by his revelation. He wants you to know and understand his will. He wants you to know and understand his good pleasure. He wants you to know and understand the things of the kingdom that you have been born into. But you must be holy. Someone can preach it. Someone can teach it. Someone who's been there can talk all about it. But you can't know it. You can't experience it if you're not holy. He wants you to be holy so he can reveal himself to you. I can remember one time he took me to heaven. I was actually out on a walk with my secretary. And every day that we would go for a walk, I would tell her to bring scripture and we would study the scripture together while we walked. And so that's what we were doing. We were going over some scripture. And I began to expound on her the revelation of God over this scripture. When suddenly my spirit was in heaven with the Father. My, I don't know what my body was doing, but my spirit was in heaven with the Father. Standing before the Father, he begins to wash me in liquid light. And all the time he's washing me in liquid light, he's talking to me about history. He starts talking to me about why he made heaven, why he made earth, why he made man, why he did this, why he did that. And it all telescoped down to this very present hour. Each time he asked me a question, why do you think I did this? And I would say to him, Lord, I don't know, because I've learned that when God asks you a question, he's not trying to find out how much you know. He's not asking you to teach him something. But what he's wanting to do is reveal the answer. So I don't know, Father, I didn't try to teach him. Sometimes I do. But I didn't that day. I was smart. And he began to share with me because. And then he would take me into the next realm of creation and tell me why he did this. And then he would say, do you know why? And then, no, Father. And then the next realm of creation. And on and on we went up to this present hour. And he said, do you know why? Do you know why I'm bringing history to this climax? And I said, no, Lord, I don't. Now listen to what he said to me. All this time he's talking to me, his liquid light is flowing through me like a river. And he said, because I had it in my heart from the beginning that there would be a day when I could pull out of the peoples of the earth a commonwealth of people who would love me so much that they would leave the world behind to go deep in me. They would leave the world up behind and they would let me separate them completely from the world so that they could know me. And when they would come so close to me that they were finally purified enough, I could bring them deep into me, fill them with myself. He said, I have waited all these thousands of years to take up my home in my people. And to live my life through the temples that I had made. He said, I have lived with a passion that has consumed me. The Father said this. And he said, Nita, and you don't know what it's like to know the passion of God. And when he said that, he put a teardrop of passion into my heart. And that little teardrop of passion was so compelling, so profound, so powerful, I began to shake and quake every part of my being. I couldn't contain the love. 
I couldn't contain the desire. I couldn't contain the want. I couldn't contain the price. I couldn't contain everything that was contained in that teardrop that drove God to do all that he had done all these thousands of years to prepare himself a people. This is the day. This is the hour. This is the moment when he's calling his people out of the world to know Christ and to live in the revelation that he had prepared for us from the beginning of time. I don't care where you've walked with God in the past. It does not matter. I don't care where you walked with him yesterday. That does not matter. I don't care how many wrong decisions you've made. That does not matter. All that matters today is the decision you make today. Will you let the world go? Will you? If what awaits you at the end of the path is union with Christ, being filled with the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's all that matters. And when I say, will you leave the world behind? I mean just that. You don't make the decision tonight. I'll do it, God, and then go home and watch your television. I mean, leave the world behind. Spend your time in prayer. Spend your time in the Word. When you're at work, you keep your mind on Christ. You learn to live in this world in Christ. He didn't pay the price of the cross. So terrible a price to have a bride covered with the filth of the world. He did it to have a bride that was pure and holy. Amen. How many of you would like the fear of God? Please stand. There's coming something so beautiful, Lord. Something we cannot relate to. We don't know it. We've never seen it before. We've never heard of it before. It is so beautiful, so sacred, so holy, so pure. It is the coming revelation of the kingdom of God. And although we don't know what we're waiting for, Lord, in our hearts, we know we're waiting for something that is so extraordinary that it could only be given in the last days of humanity. And tonight, Lord, we are here. Oh, Jesus, we are here. Because we want to know you. You said this is eternal life. That we might know thee. The one true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We want to know you. We want to know the kingdom. Any revelation that you have you have, you have held in your heart, your lofty heart, for these last days. Lord, we want it to be ours. Yes. We don't want to live in the mundane anymore. We do not want our lives to be consumed with the temporal, those, the, those things that cannot profit. But Lord, we want to be filled with the holiness of God. Give us tonight the fear of God. Raise your hands to him. 
those whose hearts are true and pure, Lord. Give them now the fear of God. Impart it to them, Lord. That they will come to hate sin the way you hate it. And they will come to love that which is holy the way you love it. Come now, Spirit of grace, and impart the fear of the Lord. Impart it to our hearts. Let us leave this place tonight changed because we have received part of God. Holy Shiparo. Arasalaru Reparta. Arandri Saparo. Parandaleata. Furadrepeko Pat. Ora la rive sherata. Manandri Saparo. We want to be touched by you, Lord. We don't want to walk the way we've walked in the past anymore. We want our feet set anew into a new place. We want to be led by the fear of the Lord. For it is the beginning of wisdom. It is the beginning of knowledge. And this knowledge of the kingdom is what we want, Lord. We want the wisdom of Paul. We want the wisdom of Moses who said, teach me your way. I may live and dwell in your truth. God, we don't want to live the way we've lived before. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What is sacred and true? Thank you, Lord Jesus. To bask in your presence, Lord, is one who pleases you. Consume us with your fire, Lord. Make us the very flame of the Lord. Infinite love. Infinite glory, infinite grace to know you, Lord. To be changed. To bring you pleasure.
We praise you, Father. Can you turn um, Jimmy Black's song, Coming Back to You? Can you reach that song specifically? If not, don't play anything. I'd like to just worship him a moment with this song. We love you, Lord Jesus.